Okay, well, we are talking about secret messages today. And there's some fun ways to give secret messages. I don't know if any of you have ever done that as kids to try to get a message to somebody and try to do it with, you know, like invisible ink and all those kind of things. Well, there is one way where you take a pe Well, some of you have these in your pew. And um, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to have your, we're all going to put one together today. But you go through and you take this marker, because why do you give a secret message anyway? Any answers? Why do we have secret messages? Maybe I have it up. So nobody else can read it. Yeah, everybody else can know what it is. And I'm not sure what that one even is. There it comes. You have to do it a lot. Huh? To keeping meaningful. Oh, well, that's a good idea. And thought of it that way. So as we look at these, we have got... So when you give a secret message, is there, re, you know, is there like more than one person that's supposed to read it? Or is it supposed to be just for one specific audience? Thoughts? None? What would you say, Jer? It's usually for a specific person, isn't it? Well, those of you that can look in front of you, some of you are going to have white pieces of paper and markers in your pews. I have one extra because... I didn't get it put out there. I've already got part of mine. Mine says, is the. So it isn't the whole message. So we've got to put these together. So when you find those on the marker, I need you to be shading them in. So I think there's one back here. Here's one for Jarek. He can do one for me. And the girls found one there. There's one here. So everybody, let's get together and see if we can put this message together. I'm sorry, those of you online can't do that this morning. But... You'll just have to pretend with us. And um, so as you're looking through these, get them shaded. And we're going to try to put this message together. So I have is the, it's actually part of our scripture reading for today. So as you're shading in, figure out what your words are. And we'll see if we can put it together. You might have to bring them up here or um, try to shout them out and see if we can put this together. All right, they're working so hard here. While they're doing that, I just want to invite all of you and thank you all for joining us today, especially those of you that are at home in your pajamas or in your living rooms. Or, but thank you for being here with us today as well. And like I said, we are working on secret, a secret message this morning. And I wanted to include all the young people, so it looks like everybody passed a sheet to somebody younger than themselves. So <laughs> that were adults anyway, so... Um, so as I get those done, we'll see who I think. Now I got to remember the message myself. Um, it's in First Corinthians two. So those of you that are at home and those of you here, if you have your own Bibles, we're going to be in First Corinthians chapter two, continuing on um, our message for this month, this section. They're still shading in. So, all right. So, are you all done? Everybody find their messages. You had to make them pretty dark, so don't feel bad about filling it in. <laughs> so it. They didn't well. They don't work perfect, but if you shade them in good, they come in pretty good. I mean, I worked at them a lot yesterday <laughs> to make sure they work. So, all right. Well, it should say something about God's wisdom. It's in the middle. Well, I don't know if they're all in the middle. Mine was in the middle. I tried to put them in the middle of the sheet of paper. So. <laughs> well, maybe our, our, our secret message is going to be too secret because we didn't get it out right. So. So how many of you found words on your paper? Okay, Mary, what is yours? Wisdom. She's got wisdom. So we have wisdom is the... What else? Anybody else get one? Connor? Of God. Of God. So I think it's wisdom of God. And? Yeah, there's something and before wisdom. Something and? 
Power, yeah, power and wisdom. <laughs> okay. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah, I tried both sides. <laughs> all right. Is there another sheet? Is that all of them? Um, all right. I think it's the word, the, the word of the. I think the word of God is wisdom and power. I think is what it is. So I must have missed a word. Sorry about that. I was doing it when I was pretty tired last night. Maybe my white marker didn't work. My white crayon tired out on me. But that's what, I mean, but it's kind of fun to look for that, isn't it? And try to see what it says and to do that. And that's, you know, but though that message was just for those of you that had the piece of paper. You couldn't put it, and then you needed to work with somebody else. You know, in the 1942, there was a secret code that nobody could understand except for a few people in hopefully the United States for the most part. But in 1942, 29 Navajo men joined the U.S. Marines and developed an unbreakable code that would be used across the Pacific during World War II. They were called the Navajo Code Talkers. The Navajo Code Talkers participated in all the assaults in the U.S. Marines led in the Pacific from 1942 to 1945. They, that included Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Peleliu, and Iwo Jima. The code talkers conveyed messages by telephone and radio in their native language, a code that was never broken by the Japanese. Up to that time, the Japanese had broken every code, and we couldn't get any strategy out and any, any commands out without them intercepting them and knowing what the, the U.S. forces were going to do. So the idea for using this came from a gentleman named Philip Johnston in 1942. He was a World War I veteran. And he was a son of a missionary who had lived among the Navajo Nation. And Johnson got the idea after reading an article that talked about how the Army had used Native American soldiers as signalmen during training maneuvers. And his experience growing up with the Navajos showed him that nobody knew the Navajo language except the Navajos. The other tribes didn't know, the American people didn't know, and obviously the Japanese wouldn't know. And he, he brought that to the um, naval base in Los Angeles, California, and they referred it to the Marines at Camp Elliott. And um, they decided to give it a try. And so the initial recruitment of the Navajo code, to code Talkers was approved, and the Navajo men had to meet all the same basic requirements. They had to go through their seven weeks of basic training. They had to know both English and Navajo fluently. They had to be able to speak both well. And so they ended up with 29 recruits, and those 29 recruits went throughout the, the, from 1942 to 1945, and there wasn't any more breaking of the code, and the Japanese had no idea what we were doing for the rest of the war, which is pretty cool. The pretty amazing stuff. The Navajo language wasn't really a secret code, was it? It wasn't something they had to think up. But it was secret because nobody knew it. It was only meant for the people in the Navajo Nation. Now, often God's word is considered mysterious or secretive when it's really just unknown to those who choose not to believe it. Last week, we started with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and the message, message was a foolish message. We discovered that the message of the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ, was and is considered foolishness to those who do not believe. And at the time of Paul, it was mainly the Jewish and Greek populations in the city of Corinth that were struggling with the message of the cross. The Jews couldn't believe it because they couldn't believe that God's son would die on a cross. I mean, it just was unfall in infallible, un unbelievable to them that that would ever happen. And then the Greeks just thought it was uh, God wouldn't do that. Uh, God wouldn't be real to them. So they both struggled with that, and they couldn't believe it. But as Paul shared, it was only foolishness to those who chose not to believe it. In chapter 2, he continued with this idea. But now he calls it a secret message or a mysterious message for those that choose not to believe. So we're going to look, begin um, in chapter 2 today on verse 6, and it will be up on the screen for you. For those of you at home, as I've said before, if you don't have a Bible, please let us know, and we'll make sure we get you one. 
but we'll be starting in verse 6. It says, Yet, when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is a mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can't know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak wisdom, words given to us by the spirit, using the spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from the God spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. And those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who themselves, who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. So first Paul begins, when I'm with mature believers, when I am with people that are believers, I can speak with wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom of God. Because the people, the wisdom of this world is soon forgotten. I mean, there are wise people out there. I mean, we, you know, there's Confucius, there was Socrates, there was Plato. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom out there. But the wisdom of God is far different than that. And the wisdom that Paul spoke of was the mystery of God, the wisdom of God. Paul said that when he was among mature believers, men and women that believe in Jesus, he could share the gospel of God. You remember that simple gospel we talked about last week? That simple gospel that, was, that Jesus was real, that he died and he, and he rose again, and that, that he will be coming again. And that we believe that we can't do it on our own, but it's only through Jesus, Jesus Christ. That's the simple wisdom. That's the, the message that Paul is talking about. And that's the one when we accept that as believers, we can understand the mysteries of God because they are there for us. When he is speaking believers, he can share the wisdom of God, which is different than the wisdom of the world and its leaders. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 2, 6 to 8, For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the path of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. God is the one who gives true wisdom. And Paul is stating that as well. Paul was sent to share the wisdom of God. But that wisdom, that message, remained a mystery to those that hadn't accepted it. When a person only listens to the other voices out there, he refuses to listen, they refuse to listen to God's voice. God's word and message were a secret, something reserved for those who believed in him and were ready to receive it. Mostly, and according to that, the Christmas spirit and the, the present Christmas spirit and Christmas... Um, Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, he said, poor hearts mostly were ready to receive the word of God. And that's what Paul is talking about. You know, that's why when we're sharing Christ's message with unbelievers, well, they think sometimes that we're crazy or that we're just stupid. Or why would, you know, that just doesn't make sense. They can't accept it. But for those that have an open heart, that their spirits have been touched and drawn those that are searching, their, their spirits are receptive, and they'll hear the message, and they'll respond to it. It may take repeating that message over and over again, and it's certainly going to make a difference if we're living it out in our lives, if we're a living testimony of what God has done to us, done in us. Then people will hear us better and respond to the message. When we read the next two verses, that the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God and his plan that was previously hidden, 
Even though it was made for his ultimate glory before the world began, God had that message for us. That message started way before you and I were around. It says, but the rulers of this world didn't understand it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This message, this mystery was a part of God's plan from the very beginning. When Adam and Eve sinned, God set into motion his plan for humankind for salvation. In Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman. And they're talking about Jesus, about God's son. And they're talking about the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And what's more, in Galatians 3, 8 through 9, it says the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. In Romans 5, it is shared even more plainly for the believers in Rome. He wrote, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and with new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, we all sin. We all became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more and more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us a right standing with God, resulting in eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. The secret message of God is for all people that are ready to respond and to receive it. We are all sinners through one man. It's disobedience. Because of Christ's one act of righteousness, all people can be made right with him, which results in eternal life with Jesus. As Paul continued in Corinthians, he said, if the rulers, if the leaders of that day would have really believed that Jesus was God's son, they never would have crucified him. But it was because he said he was God's son. It's because he said, I am, is here before you. They said it was blasphemy, and that's why they crucified him and hung him on that tree. Verses 10 to 12 reveal to us why the truths of God are more readily understood by those of us that are followers of Jesus. It said, for his spirit, God's spirit, reaches out and searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. But no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. But when you become a believer, you have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so that we can know the wonderful things that God freely gives us. The Holy Spirit searches out everything. And he shows us God's deep secrets. Paul describes God's spirit working in a similar way to our spirits. Nobody can use their human senses to know what another person thinks. We can think we do. We can get close sometimes because, especially after you've been married a long time, all of a sudden you're saying the same thing, finishing, like, oh, there was a dumb movie once. It said, oh, we're so close, we finish each other's sentences. Um, But you kind of do sometimes if you've been together a long time. But still then, you still don't know their innermost thoughts. Only that person really knows what they're thinking. And you'll hear that occasionally when you do finish their thoughts and they'll say, I didn't mean that. And they'll just want to, want to reiterate and share what they really meant. Well, that's what Paul says. We really can't know anybody else's thoughts except for God's. When God's spirit lives in us, he can draw us to himself and we can know what, he's, what he wants us to know. It's a mystery. If our spirit doesn't tell us you know, that those thoughts are, they'll be a secret and in a similar way. Nobody knows God's own thoughts except his spirit. But God wants us to know his thoughts when we know him. You know, that's when you hear somebody say, I, j- I just know that's God, what God wants me to do. I just, I just knew he called me to do this. That was kind of, you know, when God called Gary and I here to serve at South Troy, it was through his spirit. It was through circumstances. It was through people. But all those things together helped us to be called to where he wanted us to be. It wasn't a lightning bolt. 
It wasn't an audible voice. That would have made it so much simpler to know you were doing the right thing. But it was through, basically through us praying and fasting and then doing some footwork. I mean, I bought a demographic study and, and checked out the area. We drove around. We continued to just to think and to pray and to consider what it would cost us too. Because when we were asked to consider to reopen this church, we were starting from zero. There was nobody here. It was empty. It was in need of a lot of work. It was an old be building that needed a lot of money. And it wasn't us that had that. People had to donate. People in the district did not support us those first three years. We were on our own because they wanted to see if we'd make it. They wanted to, they wanted to invest into a, like that movie Money Pit. They didn't want to invest in another Money Pit. They wanted it to see if it was going to make it. And so as we fasted and prayed, we drove around and did all that stuff. I read tons of books on church planting. And I still read them occasionally just to, and just started to develop a vision. And the first year was devoted to cleanup and restoration. And there's a bunch of pictures that, are, that Mike's going to kind of put up there. Um, we started, I don't really have any tags for them. So yeah, that's what it looked like in 1950, which is way before me. I wasn't even born yet. But that's kind of what it looked like then. And then when we got it, we had a Nakama, Nakama truck help us to clean out the basement. We had a, had a Jewish flood relief organization help us gut the basement because they knew how to do that. And they helped us clean it all out and get it gutted and spray it down. And because it was, we had mold about six, eight inches up off the ground. It had been wet in the basement and we had to gut it to the to the boards, I mean, to the raw boards, took all the sheetrock out, all the carpet out, all everything, ceiling out. It was a mess. So we did that, and then in the following May, we had our first bike blessing, and I guess it's a pretty small picture, but there's a lot of paint scraped off that south side of that building because we hadn't painted it yet. And so that summer, we devoted to painting. Me and my two daughters were up on ladders all summer long painting the church. And then eventually... I don't know, just kind of flip through them. That's what it looked like before we cleared up the shrubbery. And that's what the inside used to look like. Looks a lot different than it does now, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot darker colors. And, and that, that was the first Christmas or second. And then we used to have a little bit different stuff out there. And, you know, we just kept making differences and changes over the years. And it's just amazing what God has done. But we did all those things. We had Thursday night services, and then we went to once a month services, and then we went to once a week services. <laughs> I mean, it was just a gradual process. We visited over 200 homes. We passed out batteries. We passed out scotch tape around Christmas time. We did lots of postcards, served lots of pie. We had a pie social at the end of every month for about a year and a half to just get people to come into the building and to know it was here and alive. And so it was just a lot of stuff we did. And to some people, we were doing something crazy, and it was a waste of time and money. To others, it was a novelty, and it would eventually wear out, wear off. And to still others, it was a curiosity that we're going to keep their eye on. God didn't give anyone else the assurance, and not even us, that this was going to be a success, that it would thrive and it would grow, that it would be a successful church plant. He only chose those whose hearts were open to his call. God's spirit can only speak to those who believe in him. To everyone else, it seems like a secret message. But the best thing about God's secret message, it is easy to unveil. It's like, it's as easy as this, if it's done right, to uncover, just use a color and open it up. He wants us to know what it is. We only must choose to believe it. So as we continue in our passage from chapter 2, we are at that last paragraph, that first verse in the last verse of this section. When we tell you these things, he said, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Again, Paul reminds us that he isn't trying to impress us with wit or rhetoric or fancy intellectual words. He use, isn't using $10 words and he isn't using five cent words. He is adapting the message to reach those that need to hear it. He doesn't change the bottom line. He keeps the message of the cross priority. 
but he knows how to share it with different people in different places. Paul's a great orator, and he knows those big words. I mean, he went to school, he was a scholar, he could argue with the best of them. He would have been great at, at arguing with Greek philosophers. But Paul fit his language to speak to those who were listening. He didn't use fancy words, he used plain speech. When he spoke to the Corinthians, it was different than when he spoke to the people in Athens. And then there's such a great example of this in Acts 17 when Paul speaks to the Athenians. Because when he goes there, it says, while Paul was waiting for the other disciples in Athens, he was walking around the city and he noticed they had all these shrines all over. They had idols all over the place that they worshiped because they worshiped many gods and they never really kind of decided on any one, one thing. And so he was deeply troubled and he went to the synagogue where he reasoned with the Jews and the Greeks and the God-fearing Gentiles. And he spoke daily in the public square to anybody that was what happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. And when he told them about Jesus, they said, well, we want to hear more of this. Come with us and we'll, we'll get you a bigger audience is basically what they said. And they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Another guy said, he seems to be preaching about a foreign god. So then they took him to the high council of the city. Come, tell us all about this, what you're talking about, this new teaching. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. Now, it, and he, Luke put a side note. He said, it should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Do you know people like that? They just kind of get together and just want to talk. They don't really ever get serious about anything, and they just listen and talk about everything. Well, that's kind of what they did. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them like this. He said, men of Athens, I notice you are very religious people in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you are worshiping without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who has made the world and everything in it. And he went on to share who that is. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some people laughed in contempt. Others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him. Some became believers. And among them was Dionysus, a member of the council, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Paul adapted his, his, his message to the audience. That, that is so amazing. I mean, he is such a good speaker that he could see who was there. I mean, I don't know that I would have thought of that walking past an idol of an unknown God and just say, well, that's, I can tell you all about that one. You won't be unknown anymore. And he shared with them. And they were willing to listen because he knew how to speak to them. He didn't speak to them as if they were already believers. He didn't speak to them like they were Jewish. He didn't speak to them about Jewish customs. He saw an idol and he saw the message and he built a correct message with that. He shared them the truth of the cross where they could begin to understand it. He was a gifted speaker. And later in his letter, in this same, in this letter, chapter 9, Paul writes, When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. Paul never changed the bottom line of his message. He continued to preach the cross of Christ but he found ways to identify with those that were reading and listening to his message. Now, not everybody learns that so well. There's a story that's often told about a young pastor in a rural community who still had a lot to learn about that lesson. One bitter cold Sunday, an old farmer trudged for miles through a blizzard to reach the small mountain church that he attended. And that day, nobody else showed up except for him and the pastor. And the pastor looked out over the thing, and, and, the, and the old man was sitting back. He's probably way in the back, too, no doubt. He sat on the very back pew when he came in, and, and the young man looked out there, and he said, you know, perhaps we'd do better to go home to our nice warm, warm house and get a hot drink. I mean, it's just, no, there's just the two of us here. 
you know, and he said in a tone that blatantly encouraged the old farmer to agree. And the old farmer looked at the preacher and he said, you know, I'm just a simple farmer, but when I go to feed my herd, and if only one cow shows up, I don't let her go hungry. And so the preacher was a bit embarrassed and he felt a little guilty, so then he decided, okay. So he started at the beginning and he gave the whole thing. He did all the hymns, he did all the announcements, he did everything from the top to the bottom, and it lasted over an hour. And after the service, he looked at the farmer and he said, I hope that met your needs. And the farmer said, I'm just a simple farmer, but when I go to feed my herd, if only one cow shows up, I sure don't force her to eat everything that I brought for the lot of them. <laughs> and that story is often told to show that we have to adapt our message to our audience. We have to look out there and we have to know that person. We have to know how to reach out to them. We don't give the same thing to everybody, but we keep the bottom line. We always share the truth of God's love. God's story of love for humankind sounds foolish to those whose hearts are closed to the love and truth of Christ. When we are certain of human wisdom and science, we're apt to miss the truth of God's word. We miss the calling of his spirit on our hearts to discover that secret message. We must be willing to hear God speak into our hearts. To those that are open and listening, the word of God is life and truth. To those that refuse to listen, it's just a bunch of noise. I would challenge you to continue to be faithful, living out your, that truth in your life, to be ready to speak it whenever you can. And I want to give you some simple steps today to share your faith. First, I want you to remember, too, we can't force somebody to accept it. We can't open up somebody's heart to accept God's word. You know, when I first became a Christian, I kind of tried that. I was excited. I wanted to tell everybody what happened in my life, and, and I went home and told my family. And thank goodness none of them are here today. But I shared it with my dad and told him he was wrong. You know, you don't do that. That's not a good way to start out. And he just said, and he didn't agree with me. And um, my family wanted to see if there was really going to be a change in my life. Because they knew how I'd been living up to that point. So to tell them I was a new believer in Christ and that I was going to change and live this way, they, they reserved judgment for quite a long time to wait and see if there was really a change in my heart and spirit. And, you know, I, I think they've seen that over the years now. But I went home so excited. I mean, I'm the oldest of six, so I thought I could fix everybody. It didn't work that way. <laughs> and, and I probably drove some wedges where I shouldn't have at first. But it was out of ignorance. It wasn't out of a lack of wanting to and loving my family. But that's sometimes what we do. We need to, we need to listen to God's heart. We can't force it down anybody. But we are called to do it. He, God equips us as Christians, and we are called to share what Christ has done in our lives. And, you know, nobody can ever argue about what Christ has done in your life. You can always share what Jesus has done with inside of you. You can't change somebody else, but you can always share what Christ has done. Some of Christ's last words on earth were, Go and make disciples of all nations. Sharing our faith is not a suggestion. It's a command. And God is with us when we obey him in doing it. So what do we do? How can we do this? One, live a godly life. Show those that are close to you you care. Spend time with them. Help meet their needs and offer to listen when they have problems. You might not be able to answer all their questions, but like I said, they can't deny the reality of Jesus in your life. Now, living a godly life, I want to just share the, the verses that go through my head is, the one that, one that Jesus said, obey these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. If we live those out, that's what we're talking about. And we're not talking about a list of do's and don'ts. We're not talking about being perfect because well, then we'll all screw up and that isn't going to work very well. But living a godly life with all of our heart devoted to God. Everything else will fall into place after that when we're truly putting him first, and then when we're loving others as ourselves. When we do that, we don't want to hurt God by doing those sins in our lives that we know that hurt his heart. We'll change. But that happens between us and God. And then when we live that way, that's what I'm talking about, is live a godly life. Show those 
that are close to you that you care about them. Really listen to them. Don't make them a check mark or anything. Listen to them. Give of yourself. Secondly, pray for those you interact with. If you can't think of anyone that isn't a Christian in your circle of friends, you need a bigger circle. Pray that God will bring some people into your lives that are not believers. Pray that he'll give you an opportunity to share that truth with somebody, to share your life with somebody that needs him. Third, make a habit of reading the Bible, praying, and going to church. Now, don't do these things for attention. Don't do these things because you should. Do these things because this is what God has called, because you want to grow in your faith. That's how you grow. That's how you grow. You grow with other believers. You grow by studying your Bible. You grow by reading, his, by reading it and praying. When we're passionate about what Christ has done in our lives, people will see something different about us, and they'll want to know what it is. At the same time, we must do more than just live it out. People need to hear the gospel, to hear that God loves them. Christ died for them and that they can have eternal life. Romans 10, 13 to 14 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So there's four simple steps to help you to tell. Tell somebody about God's plan. Tell them that God loves them. God loves you. And he wants you to experience the peace in life he offers. The Bible says, John 3, 16, for God, well, some of you can say that one with me, I imagine. Connor, for sure. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He has a plan for you. We can share that with somebody else. Secondly, share that we have a problem. We all have the same problem. By nature, we are all separated from God. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is holy, and there is no way that he can be with us. We can never measure up to his perfect standard. We are sinful. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So we all have a problem. We're all in this together. We're, but then on number three, talk about God's remedy for that problem. God's love bridges the gap of separation between you and him. It's like there's this big chasm and that's where we are in this big, and there's sins down here and God's over here and, and eternal life is over here, our relationship with him. But Jesus died on that cross and he bridges that gap for us. And when we receive Jesus Christ, we go from a sin and separation from God to life with God on the other side. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Peter 2.24 And then ask for a response. And then ask them if they want to receive Christ. You cross the bridge into God's family when you accept Christ's free gift of salvation. The Bible said, as many as received him, to them gave you, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1, 12. When we receive Christ, we do four things. We, admit, we have to admit that we're a sinner and ask for forgiveness and be willing to turn away from our sin. That's called repentance. So first, we have to admit that we're sinners. Anybody here, is anybody here a sinner? Yeah, we all are. So that's an easy one, mostly. You're not going to get too many people to argue with you on that one. We've all sinned. Well, then you ask God for forgiveness and repent. Now, asking forgiveness is saying you're sorry, but repentance is turning away from that sin and following God. It's saying, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. I'm going to do better. I'm going to follow you, God. I'm going to turn towards you. And then you believe that Christ died for your sins. He died for you on the cross. And then receive him into your heart and your life. And you can share that with anybody. It's not rocket science. A lot of it's just praying for that opportunity to be ready to share it with somebody else. And here's a prayer that you can do to share with them. And I'm going to challenge you to pray it today if there's somebody today. I know you've heard that a lot over the last few weeks. But this is Paul and this is, this is our priority as believers and who knows, there still are people that don't know Jesus Christ here and those here that are following us at home. So let's pray together. I mean, as, pray with me. 
and I will lead you. It's called the sinner's prayer. Um, it's something that many of us have heard and many of us have done. But if you have never prayed this, and if this is something today that is going that you are taking that step, I would I would challenge you to do that and pray with us today in your heart too. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sin and rose from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life and help me to do your will in your name. Amen. And if today is a day that you finally prayed that and you meant it for the first time, let me know. Or let somebody here at South Troy know or PM me or text me or call me or email me so that we can help you get on the right track and, and help you to get a Bible and get you those steps to help you to get started on a life with Christ. So as our worship team comes up, we're going to continue and we're going to sing a closing song together as they lead us. Um, pray for Eric.